my name is Tatiana Timoshevska, and my project is on the gas injection system for Coaxial Plasma Gun. So currently, uh, plasma propulsion still requires a lot of research for it to be an efficient method. And one such research project uh, plans to utilize torsional magnetic reconnection, which involves restructuring two opposing magnetic fields consisting of a spine and a fan along the central plane. Now, when a strong enough azimuthal magnetic field is applied to null point, the lines will, the magnetic lines will twist, break down, and can immediately reconnect. So this entire process would release high kinetic and thermal energy along the uh, spine axis, which then can be used uh, for thrust. Now, the current idea for the physical configuration is two opposing solenoids um, and a high energy class of plasma gun at, or CPG at a snow point. As you can see in that diagram, uh, you can see that the two um, coils will create a current, uh, which will then obviously connect, create a magnetic field. Um, and then the plasma jet along the middle will provide that um, torsion. And, um, and, and release that energy. Uh, now, currently the project is in the stage of remodeling the plasma gun and building such components. My part of the project is designing um, a, a gas injection system that would deliver the city argon into the vacuum chamber and then into the CPG to create that plasma. And so between the gas there needs to be a small section of a reserve uh, to contain the, the exact amount of gas required. And so that will consist of a small length of piping, only a few centimeters, be connected to one solenoid valve, which I call the fill, so fill solenoid, which will, which will fill the reserve in another valve, which I call the fire valve, to release the gas into the chamber. Now filling the reserve is a fairly simple process that can be stopped manually when we see that the required pressure is reached. However, releasing gas into the chamber is a little more complicated since it needs to be perfectly timed with the release of current into the CPG so that the, there is maximum thrust. Uh, in fact, the time delay is, needs to be specific to the millisecond, uh, which can't really be accurately done um, manually and therefore needs to be automatic. Um, the, the current for the, in the first draft was using Arduino, uh, which will uh, provide the time delay and a breadboard for the circuit. Before, before this uh, project, I had never worked with something like this. So I spent the first, almost the first two weeks uh, doing research on first simple circuits and then more complex designs so that I, so that I could um, build my own design and um, this is you know, specific to our um, project. Um, and so what I came up with is a three-part process. When a uh, button is pressed, it will send a signal to the Arduino. So we then send two signals, one to the LED, which will tell us if the basic process is working. And then one to the MOSFET, uh, or which is a high um, voltage transistor, uh, its gate, it will send it to its gate. And then when that happens, the, the transistor's um, drain and source will connect, therefore closing the entire uh, valve circuit. Um, and, and this, is, and this uh, MOSFET is used so that when the 12 volt supplies necessary uh, current into the solenoid, it will, not, um, it will be isolated from the Arduino and therefore uh, will not Pull, put current into the Arduino, which can only handle about five volts. So we want that completely separated. Now for the code on the Arduino uh, ID, ID is fairly simple. It will read the signal from button, and if it's in the high state or the on state, we'll send a high signal, disagate, and then the LED, as well as the LED, for a best amount of, amount of time, which in this example code is 500 milliseconds or a half a second. Now, when we do actual testing, that will vary depending on, you know, what kind of test we need to run. 
Uh, there's also a breakout variable, which will stop the code from uh, looping. And so this one will not keep um, turning on and off once it is fired once. Now, real next question to ask is if the Arduino and transistor fast enough for our specifications. Um, so for that, I use an oscilloscope to probe the voltage delay between the transistor gate and its drain. Um, and I found that there was parasitic isolations known as reaming in the MOSFET. Um, fortunately, this quickly decays into a steady signal in less than a microsecond. And therefore, due to this small nanosecond time scale, uh, these objects can be mostly ignored and it can be um, modeled as a steady drop from 12 to zero volts. However, what could be significant is does the solenoid valve actually actuate fast enough? Um, and so for that, I measured the voltage in the MOSFET drain and the, directly the current in the solenoid. Um, I found that the delay, the delay between it's just opening and the solenoid current going into about 90% of its max, and that's when it will actuate, is about 13 milliseconds. Um, when compared to the total injection time, which is about 300 milliseconds, that is, fair, that is fairly um, significant, but the delay is consistent and can therefore be accounted for in our testing. Uh, so far, we've been using a breadboard, which is perfect when you need uh, uh, we need to like replace components or wires when you're still in the early stages of the project. But now we found that the current circuit is working. Uh, we needed something more less flimsy and more reliable, and more permanent. And a PCB, a printed circuit board, are perfectly uh, perfect for this. At first, we thought to buy. Uh, you know, a uh, custom one, just like online. But um, I just, just I decided to use a PCB kit and solder the components myself, um, so that we were semi permanently fixed. Um, so that's it holds together well. Um, the biggest drawback of this is it required many screw terminals because uh, they're still in connect the wires coming from the Arduino, the battery, and the uh, solenoids. We didn't want the uh, fix the Arduino permanently in case there were some kind of malfunctions. We need to replace the um, Arduino entirely, which would be more difficult. It was permanently fixed. So next question is, is the current reserve uh, volume really the op optimum? Previously in the MATLAB simulation, we calculate uh, that the initial reserve volume would not impact most parameters such as um, max mass flow, or average thrust. However, when we ran it again, it showed that the total injection time is directly to, related to reserve volume. The, when we increase the volume, it would increase the total time that it would take for the, um, all, all the gas to escape into the gas chamber. Uh, and that would increase the average mass flow over the initial 15 milliseconds as seen in the graph. Um, and then, then in turn would increase the average thrust of initial 50 milliseconds. Um, therefore, I decided to lengthen the reserve from some centimeters to 19 centimeters. And now what 19 centimeters would still be um, reasonable for our setup. However, the total volume actually less than double because um, a lot of the um, volume was in the solenoid and, and solenoid valves themselves. And therefore, there's not a direct relation between the length and the volume. Uh, in the final stages, which was the last couple of weeks, I assembled the piping and the control boxes. There were two temporary control boxes, one to, uh, for the field valve, which um, included just a simple switch and battery and a place to put in solid uh, uh, wires, and one for the release valve, which included a switch on the top the PCB on the side, and the Arduino and battery sitting freely on the lid. Uh, finally, I some of the piping to the vacuum gas feed through. Well, that actually required three relief valves at different points, so that if any gas ends up somehow being trapped inside, we could release it into the uh, room. 
there wouldn't be anything backed up. But the basic premise is that from the feed through, we go to the reserve uh, and then to the pressure gauge and the math flow controller. So that, which makes sure that there's a steady and slow um, flow to the reserve. So we could, or, you know, in, this, in a reasonable time, stop the flow. And then, then I go to the gas cylinder. So in conclusion, I really uh, learned a lot of useful knowledge and skills. Uh, coming from almost no knowledge of circuits, now I'm able to uh, read and design schematics. Uh, and I also um, learned how to basically uh, do build vacuum piping from scratch. Um, and from my from the graduate student that I'm working with, I learned about high voltage safety. If I continue to um, work on this project, I'll have I'll have to uh, work on with voltages going up to ten kilovolts, which can be very hazardous and require a lot of safety rules. Also for the two weeks of this internship, I took the intro to plasma physics and fusion energy webinar EPL. And there I listened to notes from so many different lectures on uh, plasma. Well, I didn't use most, uh, any of the, most of this on, the, uh, on this project. Uh, this is going to be really useful in the future. Uh, since I did really enjoy this research, so I will hopefully continue this um, in the graduates programs or even my career. So uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm free to answer them. Thank you. That was great. Gotcha. Well, um, my name is Victor De La Cruz Cordero. This summer, I was working on the nanomechanical resonators based on molybdenum, the sulfide crystal membranes. I worked alongside uh, a group of colleagues. Uh, first off, I worked with Shahadat Hossein from the Department of Physics at UAB. Also, I worked with William Davis, also from the Department of Physics at UAB. Uh, Seikad Pukur from the Department of Physics at Auburn University. And last but not least, my mentor, uh, Dr. Renato Kamada also from Department of Physics at UAB. And before I get started, I would just like, I'd like you to keep in mind uh, these four, these four uh, concepts here regarding my presentation. As you can see down here, I would like you to keep in mind uh, what are nanical, na nanomechanical resonators, uh, the goals of this research project, description of the experimental apparatus and vacuum setup, and the project status and ongoing work. So what are nanomechanical nano resonators? Basically when a freestanding, sorry. When a freestanding film of a two, 2D material is placed on, over a micro orifice on a surface, basically we have here our resonator. This will be our 2D uh, material just sitting on top of this orifice here. Uh, the film will behave like a membrane that can vibrate in, res in response to exter external influences. So for example of the 2D material, molybdenum the sulfide, uh, also known as MOS2, whenever it's placed on top of a circular hole of 5 to 10 micrometers, the membrane has a natural frequency of oscillation in the 10 to 25 megahertz, depending on the atomic, depending on the number of atomic monolayers it comprises. So in, in other words, basically, depending on how thick our resonator here is, that's gonna determine how much is gonna vibrate uh, between the 10 to 25 megahertz. Assembly of MOS2 resonators. The 2D MOS2 membranes in the form of MOS2 flakes are exfoliated from a bulk crystal and placed on a viscoelastic stamp. Uh, in other words, here we have on our left, we have our MOS2 crystal. And right over top, we have um, basically a tape. That's how we're able to exfoliate um, 
because you know it's it goes over the crystal and once we take it off that's what sticks on um the tape here and goes on our uh, our glass which later on that this is where the stamping into the circular micro cavities comes in play uh the mos2 resonators are then assembled using a modified inverted microscope micro stamping device which allow us which allows aligning the two D flakes onto circular micro cavities defined on as a silicon wafer, which is what we have right here. So basically, we have our silicon wafer, which uh, you could consider as uh, like a, uh, a microchip. And here we have our our membranes, our MOS two, sitting on top of the cavities, or in other words, and on top of the holes. And that's how we're able to measure uh, our uh, or frequency, which I'll explain later on in more detail. Our silicon wafer has some um, some special properties, I guess you could say, because it's a 300 micrometer thick uh, silicon wafer with thermally grown 285 nanometers uh, silicon dioxide. The wafer has cavities which are five to 10 micrometers in diameter which are, uh, as you can see down here, and are 320 nanometers deep. The MOS2 films are stamped on top of the cavities, like I explained earlier. Uh, here you have the MOS2 sitting on top of the cavity. And to put it into another perspective, another angle, basically, we'll have the, the resonators, the membrane sitting right on top of here. You can see on the left side, and they'll be uh, vibrating up and down here. Long-term goals of the project. So using a helium neon a Heaney laser, we plan to measure the resonant frequency and the mechanical dissipation in the optical cavities formed by these nanodrums and the bottom of the hose, which act as mirrors for the Heaney laser. Our goal is to measure the vibrational properties of the resonators using a frequency sensitive photo detector whose signal is processed by a spectral analyzer. Ultimately, we want to study how the vibrational properties of the resonators depend on environment, such as a well-controlled RF or laser generator plasma. A very important component uh, when it comes to our, uh, our project here it's the laser, which is defined as a device that utilizes the natural oscillations of atoms or molecules between energy levels for generating a beam of coherent electromagnetic radiation, usually in the ultraviolet, visible, or infrared regions of the spectrum. And um, some uh, important aspects of our of a laser are that uh, one particle of light is essential, essentially duplicated many times. Weak light that enters a collection of excited atoms in which the light is amplified and becomes brighter. The light now contains more photons and the laser medium acts as a light amplifier. So to put that all of that into perspective, uh, here we have our nice illustration uh, from Wikipedia. And uh, basically, Whenever a electron is on the ground level, because that's where they like to be, whenever they're on, on the ground level and are, and they're basically uh, energy gets transferred to them by, in this case, by plugging in the laser to our power source, the electrons go from the ground level to the excited level. And it just happens that there's a photon passing by and basically drags along the electron with it. And during emission, it basically duplicates itself into two, if that makes sense. So now they're here on this side and same process just keeps on repeating itself where now instead of having one uh, photon, you have two. Now when it's going back, it grabs onto another electron and it keeps, uh, you know, rather than two, you have four. Then you get six, eight, and so on and so you know, so forth. 
and that's how the basically the light becomes stronger and that's how we get our, our, our light from our laser, which will be coming out of here because this will be basically a, a glass here. My contributions this summer, uh, we had, we were setting up the resonators in a compact vacuum chamber. Had to set up a small chamber with sapphire window of high transparency and installed MOS2 resonators. The reason why we did this is because uh, this was our original setup right here. This is our original chamber. And as you can see, we have uh, our chip uh, sitting in there. And right over that, we have our, the glass. Now this glass was a bit too thick and it was making it, it was making it a bit difficult for us to uh, get a clear view of our resonators. So we went ahead and transferred the chip over to this smaller uh, chamber here. As you can see in this picture, it's installed right here. And we went ahead and used a much clearer and thinner uh, sapphire glass that we, we were able to get a clear view of the resonators. Also, uh, we had to set up a vacuum pump for the, for the chamber. We connected a, a small chamber to a vacuum system and were, and were able to obtain a pressure of three millitor, which should be adequate for detection of MOS2 resonance. Uh, here we have our vacuum pump, which we connected to our chamber, which is sitting here um, via uh, with, with this tube. And like I said, that's how we were able to bring down the atmospheric pressure to 3.3 millitor, which uh, should be adequate for the detection of the, the vibrations. Uh, this is our uh, the setup here. Um, basically, we have our laser, our Heaney laser coming, uh, you know, with the light coming out here, which uh, runs into the neutral density filters and the beam expanders which basically serve the purpose of making the light weaker or stronger or whatever you like to do with that. So um, basically if you want the light to be stronger then you will remove the filter. And if you want it lighter, then you could you know, mess with the filters and, and mess with that. So the light comes out of the uh, laser, it runs into the first mirror, goes to the beam expander, like I explained, then runs into the second mirror and goes all the way to the chamber here. Once the light gets to the chamber, it basically bounces back to our first uh, beam splitter, which what it does is it sends 50% of the light towards the camera and another 50% of the light comes to the second uh, beam splitter. What that does is serves the same purpose again, but in this time, it sends 50% of the light to the photo detector. And yes, and you guys also see the same, same information here on our, on our picture. Light bounces back. Also, the, these are some of the, the equipment that we work with in their lab. We have our waveform uh, monitor. We have our power for laser, spectrum analyzer and RF modulator, which is what reads the, the frequency of the resonators. And here we have our laptop, which is connected to the camera. And uh, that's how we're able to see the, the resonators. Uh, here we have an example of what it, this is what it looks like uh, whenever the laser it's, basically hitting our, our uh, wafer, the chip. So what it would look like uh, with, the, with the laser when it's not hitting it. And another example of when the laser is concentrated on the wafer. Uh, some uh, challenge that we're now addressing is uh, external vibrations due to the connected vacuum pump. Uh, and some potential solutions would be one, the one kilohertz pump vibrations 
are unlikely to interfere with detection of the 1025 megahertz membrane motion. If it does, we might consider adding a vib vibration oscillation, or can we acquire good resonance data quickly when the vacuum is turned off before we start losing a uh, vacuum? Uh, three important things, I mean, three important aspects of vibrations to keep in mind, and I got this from the engineeringpost.com, is that th there's three type main types of vibrations. Uh, first one is the longitudinal, which the medium moves parallel to the direction of the object. Then we have transverse, which the medium moves perpendicular to the direction of the object. And we have torsional vibration, which basically the shaft is twisted and untwisted alternately. Uh, like I explained, this is our vacuum uh, setup. And this right here is another example of um, a problem we, uh, you know, what it looks like whenever we're running into uh, vibrations issues due to the pump. You can see here that we have a, in the middle, it covers about six holes. This is a resonator, but it's a bit unclear due to the, you know, to the, the vibrations from the pump. Uh, in conclusion, I uh, explained what nanomechanical resonators are, the long-term goals of detecting MOS2 resonance in probe plasma processes, described by a contribution in setting up the vacuum system for the experimental apparatus, and plans to address external vibration challenges due to vacuum pump. Uh, like I said, I did not work on this uh, project by myself, and I'll also like to thank my uh, my other lab colleagues, uh, uh, what was his name, Nitesh, uh, Zar, Kareem, and um, Shahadat for uh, always helping me, you know, trying to understand my project uh, even, even better than I already did. And that is everything for me. Any questions? Yes, any questions, anyone? All right. Well, thank you so much, Victor. That was okay. great. Really Perfect. appreciate it. And um, I guess um, if you could stop sharing your screen, then we'll we'll have Karim go ahead and share his screen. All right. But thank you so much. Thank you. Some virtual clapping there for you. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. And am I audible? You are. Mm -hmm. So this is Kareem Haddad, who's also doing his RIP internship at UAB with Dr. Kamada. So uh, I will turn it over to you. Okay. So I'll be discussing a cryogenic system for electrical transport measurements of laser plasma synthesized superconducting materials. Uh, I work on this project with my mentor, Dr. Renato Camara, and we both uh, work here at UAB in the Department of Physics. So I will start with an outline of this presentation. I will start with a project briefing, then I'll go into the whole setup. Uh, then I'll move on to the compressor and the thermodynamics involved. Then I'll discuss the vacuum system, the cryogenic expander, some other components and the experimental trial I ran. And I'll conclude by closing remarks and my goals for the future for this project. So to start, uh, the study of the superconductor quantum material iron selenide, FESE, uh, which is synthesized in lab through pulsed laser deposition, PLD, uh, has many great applications, especially in quantum computing, high field magnets, sensors, and detectors. But to get to the superconductive state of iron selenide, we need to bring it down past its critical temperature. And this is done through extreme cooling. And once that is done, 
we can therefore move on to conduct electrical measurements and we can then measure the resistivity or the other uh, voltages and currents involved to compute all the calculations needed uh, with the superconductivity of FESV. But it's not an efficient idea to do it manually every time. You know, we can get liquid helium or liquid nitrogen, we can pour it on the sample, but it's not very efficient uh, because you can't really monitor the temperature change or like the cooling rate uh, directly or in an accurate way. So we have, we have to have a specific mechanical setup to do that. And that's where I come in because my main setup, as you can see, it consists of a compressor, an expander, and a vacuum pump. These are the main components for my setup. They are the components that drive it. Of course, I did use other components that I'll discuss later, but these are the main driving forces of my setup. And our goal with this project or with this setup is to get as low as three to eight Kelvin through a thermodynamic cryogenic cycle to get past the critical temperature of the iron selenide. That's our goal and that's how we choose to address it. Okay. The compressor, which is this uh, big unit shown here on the right, uh, operates on the Gifford-McMahon cycle. And the Gifford-McMahon cycle, named after the two, two men who invented it, uh, involves a closed loop system with a working gas, uh, typically helium. That's what we're using in this project. And this gas undergoes cyclic compression and expansion. That's basically the main two steps of this cycle. The cycle involves four steps, however, and I'll discuss them and go into further detail on the next slide. But this cycle, the Gifford-McMahon cycle, allows the attainment of temperatures below 10 Kelvin. And also did the convergence in like degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit to show just how low that temperature is. Keep in mind that, the, that the, we can't reach anything uh, below zero Kelvin because it's absolute zero. Even 0 0.001 Kelvin is very hard to attain. So 10 Kelvin is a pretty big goal for us to make these measurements and the study of the superconductivity. As you can see here, we have these two metal tubes and these are for the, this is where the helium flows. It flows onto the expander that I will explain later, but these, go straight into the expander. You can see here we have these uh, tubes for the cooling water. And it's important to discuss the purpose of this cooling water. Like where does water come into play in this setup? And keep in mind that as the compressor is operating, it's extracting heat from the expander and it needs to be cooled. That's why we make use of uh, a water stream that cools the compressor. So we don't run into overheat issues or troubles with our setup. Moving on, uh, I did mention the previous slide, the Gifford-McMahon cycle. Uh, I did say that this cycle involves four steps. First, we have the compression of the gas. The gas is basically compressed using, using the compressor. And this increases the pressure and the temperature of the gas. The second step is the heat transfer. Uh, the compressed gas passes through a heat exchanger where it releases heat to the surroundings and this results in a pressure drop. And this happens inside of the expander vacuum shroud. I will show this component in the next slide. The third step is the expansion of the gas. Basically the cooled gas, the helium, enters the expander and it expands rapidly there. And this leads to a decrease in pressure and temperature. And the last step is cooling. Basically the expanded gas is directed back to the heat exchanger and there it absorbs heat from the system being cooled. Now keep in mind that this is a cycle. So basically all of these four steps, uh, once, once we're done with cooling, it restarts with compression and it goes on back and forth. Basically it's a repetition of this process listed above 
And this achieves further cooling. So the more we run the setup, the more we run the cycle, the further cooling we'll get. I'll also talk about the vacuum system that I incorporated. So basically, uh, we, we need a pressure of 10 to 100 millitor inside of the expander, but it's not directly inside of the expander. I'll show in the next slide, but it is, it, it's not easy to be attained a pressure as low as 10 to 100 millitor. So we make use of this big unit shown on the right. This is a RUVAC pump. Uh, it's an air compressing vacuum pump which is typically used to establish and maintain a low pressure environment within the cryostat system. Uh, the cryostat uh, contains the cooled or superconducting components. Uh, in our case, we're studying iron selenide. So this is the cooled component that we plan on studying. And it requires a vacuum to minimize heat transfer through conduction and convection. Now keep in mind that uh, the vacuum is also important for another reason. Like, why is the vacuum there? Or what's the point of the vacuum? Basically, if we don't make vacuum, all the water from the atmosphere will condense on the platform inside of the expander where the sample is. It's gonna condense there. And then it's gonna be uh, a mess because we're gonna have ice basically covering the sample, covering the sensors that I'm gonna talk about later. And it just makes it uh, very difficult to track the measurements and it's gonna make it very messy. That's why we uh, use this pump because it helps maintain the slow pressure. And moving on from that, I will talk about the expander itself, which is a very important component for this setup. So as I said, the expander is responsible for generating the cooling effect by rapidly expanding the compressed gas. This is basically where the gas expands. Now the compressed gas, helium in our case, enters the expander chamber from the compressor. As I showed you before, the two, me uh, the two uh, metallic tubes, they come into here. One of, one of them is for the supply and one of them is for the return of the helium. They supply it to the expander and the expander itself moves back and forth within the chamber and this causes the gas to rapidly expand during the expansion stroke. And this is an adiabatic process, which leads to a decrease in the temperature and therefore leading to the cooling effect. Adiabatic means that there is no heat transfer externally. So it's pretty insulated, as I say here, because it's like uh, isolated thermally from the surroundings. And this minimizes heat transfer with the atmosphere and the external world. And after the expansion stroke, the expander returns to its initial position, and then we can restart the cycle and achieve further cooling. I also make use of other components, uh, which allow us to take data and measurements from the experiment. These components help stabilize the setup and make the measurements more accurate. We make use of a pressure regulator and this pressure regulator measures and displays the pressure inside of the vacuum chamber of the expander. This is necessary because uh, we need to track the pressure inside of the expander uh, because we need a pressure as low as 10 to 100 millitor for the cycle. So we need a way to track it, to monitor, to, to know when to make these calculations or take, start taking data. And also we make use of temperature sensors and a controller. Uh, both of which work in measuring the temperature inside of the expander. As I mentioned before, our goal is to get as low as three to eight Kelvin. And we need a way to track the temperature inside of the expander. That's why we attach sensors inside of the expander and we hook them up to a controller which displays the temperature. That way we can measure the cooling rate and we can track the temperature of the sample that we're gonna place inside of the expander. I also use venting valves and they're used to vent out the built up pressure inside of our setup. So let's just say we're done for the day. Uh, we wanna leave, we wanna turn off the setup. It's very important to vent it out because all this built up pressure needs to be released back to the atmosphere. So we can open the setup and like check for leaks or check on the sample. 
So it's very important to vent out the built up pressure at the end of the experiment. As shown here on the left, this is the 331 Lakeshore temperature controller. This is what, what measures the temperature. Uh, I'll go into further detail regarding this unit in the next slides. And on the right, this is a pressure regulator monitor. It displays the pressure uh, tracked in my cycle. As you can see, it displays your 6.3 millitor, which is uh, what we're aiming for with our setup. I also ran an experimental trial with my setup. Uh, I've put it for five and a half hours. And as you can see how efficient it performed, it went from 312.9 Kelvin to 10.916 Kelvin in five and a half hours. As you can see on the temperature controller, the temperature is displayed here in the top right corner. You can see the significant decrease in temperature after five and a half hours. Now this temperature decrease rate is good for our study because we did reach a pretty significant temperature, which is uh, very important for our setup, but it needs to be improved if we wish to attain three Kelvin. I also did plot the data I measured from my setup. So here in the first graph, you can see a, a graph, the temperature versus time. And as you can see, initially, we had a temperature of 300-ish, 320, 310 Kelvin. And you can see as time goes on, the temperature is decreasing with a slope of 0 0.081, a negative slope. That means that this is the cooling rate. That means that the, that the temperature is decreasing at a rate of 4.86 Kelvin per minute at the start. And then at this point, the cooling basically uh, becomes much harder to attain and achieve. And it slows down to 0 0.005 Kelvin per second or 0 0.3 Kelvin per minute. And this makes sense because when cooling in a cryostat, the rate of cooling tends to slow down as the temperature of the object being cooled approaches the temperature of the cooling medium or the cryostat itself. And I want to go into further detail and explain the temperature gradient we have because cooling occurs due to a temperature difference between the object and the cooling medium. As I said before, here the cooling medium is uh, liquid helium. Initially, the temperature difference is significant and heat transfer is rapid, as you can see with this uh, much bigger slope. And as the object's temperature decreases, the temperature gradient between the object and the cooling medium reduces. And this leads to a decrease in the rate of heat transfer and therefore a decrease in the rate of cooling. And here in the second graph, I measured the controller voltage versus time. So basically not only does the temperature controller measure the temperature, it also measures the voltage. And this is what it actually measures. Basically the way the controller works is it measures the voltage and it has a calibration curve inside of it. And it makes uh, a lot of mathematical computations to output the temperature from the voltage. So this is what it's actually measuring. And then it computes the temperature from that measured data. And as you can see, uh, as the temperature decreases, the voltage is increasing over the same uh, time period. So they're inversely proportional to one another. This is basically a schematic of the whole setup. As you see, this is the compressor, the main unit. Uh, these are the gas lines where the helium flows into the expander. This is a power cord, power cable that connects the expander to the compressor. This is how they communicate with one another. Uh, this is the expander itself. This is the sample holder. This is where the sensors, temperature sensors are and where the iron selenite is gonna be placed. This is uh, the radiant heat shield. It helps achieve further uh, lower temperatures by insulating more heat. This is the main vacuum shroud. This is the vacuum pump, the vacuum valve. This is to vent the built up pressure as I explained previously. And this is the temperature controller which tracks the temperature and the voltage. And this is where the vacuum is created. So you have the sample here, you have this radiant heat shield on top of it and the vacuum is basically between this radiant heat shield and the vacuum shroud itself. And these are some uh, physical representations of my setup. This is the pump. 
connected to the expander. This is the compressor. This is basically, I don't know if you can see it, this is a venting valve. This is where we release the built-up pressure. And this is the temperature controller. I wanna conclude by closing remarks. So basically the cryogenic cycle I worked on is very crucial in lowering the temperature of our quantum samples because uh, it's not efficient to do it manually. Some people try doing it and it's basically not efficient. And temperatures as low as 10 Kelvin are very, very hard to achieve. So we need a cycle to perform that. Now keep in mind that there are still a few tweaks here and there to improve the efficiency of the setup. This is a work in progress. And later on in the future, we'll be conducting electrical measurements of those samples using a potential stack to explore even further applications and measure the resistance and resistivity and all those measurements. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the FTPP for making this internship possible and this project feasible. I'd also like to acknowledge my coworkers in the lab, Nitesh, Victor, Zar, Shahadat, and my mentor, mentor of course, because they, they were very supportive and they did provide a lot of input and uh, helpful suggestions throughout this internship. And with that, I also will mention some references I used. And with that, I'm done. Any questions? Any questions? I guess not, but uh, thank you so much, Kareem. That was great. Thank you. Virtual claps. <laughs> All right. So our, our next um, speaker will be Khadija Jalul, who is at UAH doing her internship, working with Dr. Ganbari. So I will let you pull up your screen. All right, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Khadija, and uh, I am a student at UAH, majoring in aerospace engineering and minoring in math. So over the course of this RIP program, uh, me and my mentor, Dr. Kayvon Genberry, we have worked on a project uh, titled Radial Evolution of Solar Wind Turbulence Within the Co-Rotating Interaction Regions. Uh, so to get started, let's uh, get the keywords of this title and uh, see what they mean, and then uh, go from there to see what is the result in the experiment we have uh, did during this project. So as I mentioned, this is the outline, and uh, we're going to see uh, what is a solar wind, uh, what is the CIR, which is the Coritainer Interaction Regions, what is turbulence, what are the tools used in this research, and how does turbulence changes within uh, the Coritainer Interaction Regions. So honestly, I was one of those people that thinking that sun is, uh, is there to uh, give us heat and energy to survive on Earth. But actually, it turns out that the sun is a gigantic ball of plasma that is continuously emitting uh, charged particles. Um, this continuous stream of charged particles, mainly protons and electrons, uh, is the solar wind. Uh, Coordinated cool interaction regions, uh, it's a phenomenon that occurs in the solar wind. Uh, it happens uh, when the faster solar wind uh, coming from the coronal holes, which are regions of open magnetic field lines, interact with solar, um, slower solar wind coming uh, from other regions uh, on the sun. Also in this picture showing uh, heliospheric current sheets. Uh, so what is heliospheric current sheets? Um, so as the sun rotates, uh, the magnetic field lines get twisted and stretched. Uh, due to the differential rotation of the sun's equator and poles, uh, this, this uh, twisted and uh, stretched uh, magnetic field lines eventually reach um, a point where they flip from positive to negative. So they flip polarities or vice versa. Uh, this transition point forms the what we call heliospheric current sheets. Now, what is turbulence? So a little bit formally about the difference between um, turbulent flow and non-turbulent flow, which we call laminar. Uh, as you can see here, if you can imagine this as two pipes where the, the water is flowing down, uh, the, the laminar flow is uh, a smooth and a steady flow and linear. And if you imagine that if we increase a little bit uh, speed of this water, 
uh, these small eddies uh, created and then we have no longer uh, a smooth or linear flow. Uh, so the turbulent flow is characterized by uh, random, random, randomness and non-linearity. Now, in this project, our focus was to investigate investigate the changes in the solar wind turbulence uh, within the corotating interaction regions as it move as this solar wind moves radially upward in the heliosphere. So during a span of one year and a half, starting in mid-June 2020 uh, to December, uh, the last of December 2021. Um, we have collected data from three spacecrafts, namely uh, um, Parker Solar Probe or PSP, uh, Wind and Solar Orbiter spacecrafts. Uh, we get the data. These spacecrafts basically are at different radial distance from the sun, and that's what we need. Uh, so we got data from these spacecrafts, and the focus was uh, to determine uh, the CIRs observed by each one and then investigate each one uh, um, individually to see if we can find say ours that were observed by at least two spacecrafts and of course taken into consideration the trajectories of these say ours and the tra trajectories of the spacecrafts okay so indeed we determined the say ours observed by each spacecraft and we have found uh, five say ours observed by a PSP 12 by a solar orbiter and 19 by wind. Uh, and it's worth to mention that we have encountered a lot of data gaps in the data we have extracted from OmniWeb uh, website. Uh, but actually concern and uh, or taken into consideration how does the scale, like how big the uh, solar system, how big Earth, how big the spacecraft. So we are lucky that we find one stay ARs um, observed by uh, solar orbiter and wind, <clears throat> and that was on a uh, day uh, 15 November uh, 2021, 2021. And then we have collected data for um, one a two day, two days period, and we have centered the CIR as you can see in this picture. Uh, we have followed a model where where we we identified the CIR as a peak in the magnetic field, a peak in uh, the density and uh, the speed also in temperature. And if you can see here, uh, the speed is, is uh, lower for a, so we have a high density for a, low, a slower solar wind and um, a lower density for a high solar wind. All right, now we're gonna talk about uh, what we call a turbulent cascade. So in turbulent systems, energy is transferred from larger scales, as you can see here, big vortices, um, uh, to a smaller uh, scales through process that, that I mentioned earlier called cascade. Uh, in other words, when the big vortex repeatedly break up to a smaller ones, and those ones again break up uh, to another small ones, so faster, um, so it it does this process stops basically when uh, the vortex or the vortices gets too small, so uh, they get subjected to friction and then they dissipate it to heat. Um, in the other figure he here on the right uh, bottom on the right, uh, it's the power spectral density uh, plot uh, showing the, uh, the the magnetic field for uh, a wind spacecraft for the three hour sub interval. Uh, so what is power spectral basically? It's power spectral density is a mathematical tools that is used here to describe how energy distributed um, across different frequencies. And this is a log uh, scale. Um, so which in this case of turbulence, it shows the energy from large scale turbulent eddies uh, is successively transferred to uh, smaller and smaller scales until it reaches um, uh, dissipation scales uh, at the end here, and then uh, it eventually um, uh, converted to heat. Now, uh, after uh, getting the two days period uh, data, we have calculated the energy, the turbulence energy using this equation. Uh, and uh, we have calculated for three hours period, like sub intervals, 
and then we have plotted it for both spacecraft, the wind and solar orbiter, um, as you can see here. And we did the same thing for um, the bend overland. So what is bend overland? Uh, uh, so as turbulence cascade from large scales to smaller scales, energy transfer from larger um, scale eddies to smaller eddies, this cascade started at a specific frequency. Um, in the power spectrum that we just saw uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so that frequency is converted to length and we call it the bend over length. Um, and this is the, again, the bend over length for both spacecraft uh, plotted into the same plot. So according to theory, uh, let's, let me get back here to the bend over length um, and the energy. So uh, according to theory, the energy is expected to decrease with the radial um, distance while the, um, the magnetic field, well, actually the, the energy is, is expected to decrease while the magnetic field or the bend over, sorry, is expected to increase with the radial distance. But in this, this is, wasn't the case for our study. And that was due to the fact that the two spacecrafts uh, were not as they were close to each other at the time they have seen the CAR, and that was about 0 0.07 AU, and that actually affected our study a little bit. Uh, but as, as I mentioned, um, according to theory, the energy is expected to decrease uh, with the radial distance while the bend over length. Uh, is expected to increase. And we can see here a sli slightly close to each other, but um, as I mentioned, this is due to the fact that the spacecraft were close to each other uh, at the time they see the, they see the, the CAR. <clears throat> so the conclusion, this is actually some of, of the results we have got from our project. So we have identified the CIRs observed by each spacecraft, and as I mentioned, five CIRs observed by PSP, uh, 12 by solar orbiter, and 19 by wind. And we have uh, found one CIR observed by solar orbiter and wind, and we studied turbulence as that CIR moved radially outward. Um, and again, since the radial distance between the two observations is very small, this comparison between the and over length cannot be uh, conclusive. Um, I think this is the last slide on my presentation. And I wanna, uh, again, um, thank my mentor for his patience and um, his time and help through the process of getting learning about uh, a whole uh, new area of science, um, which is plasma. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? I guess not. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. I see we have some virtual claps for you. <laughs> so. Good job, Khadija. Thank you. All right. So our next speaker is Gareth Hill, who's doing his uh, RIP internship here at UAH with Dr. Nakanatoni. And I think... You're ready if you want to go ahead and share your screen. All righty, yes. Can everybody see this? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, my name is Gareth Hill, and I'll be telling you about my project of the development of quasi neutral multifluid simulations for future technologies and enabling plasma processes. So, in the beginning, we have the contents, which are pretty self-explanatory. I won't dwell on that for too long. And I thought I'd include a little bit about myself as I'm 20 years old, currently a rising junior at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, where I'm majoring in mechanical engineering and physics. And this is my first summer internship. And I was so pleased to have the opportunity to learn about plasma physics here. Uh, in my free time, I, uh, I'm a classically trained man for almost 16 years now, and I love to play regularly. I love to cook and garden with my uh, my girlfriend, although she's uh, she's more like teaching me how to cook and garden. I'm picking it up. And I love to hike and backpack across America. 
onwards. Alrighty. So, this summer I got to come to UAH and study with my mentor who works um, at UAH and alongside with NASA. And this project specifically focused on the plasma that the sun generates in the solar wind. On top of that, I was given this awesome opportunity to go to the PPL Fusion Energy and Plasma uh, Physics Introduction Course by uh, Dr. Mazaru Nakanotana, who researches and studies waves in this plasma. Um, and our goal was to write from scratch uh, a complete two fluid and three fluid model. And we chose this, these multi-fluid models for uh, several reasons, actually, as we wanted to look at particle species within the plasma. So a very, very minute scale uh, simulation. Um, in the two fluid model, we looked at electrons and protons. And in the three fluid model, we added the helium two plus ion, which is a, um, a particle that is, part, is in the solar wind. Um, what makes these so good is that they're different than uh, larger scale models like magnetohydrodynamics, which actually restrict your species to one and are for a much larger scale. And what sets the, our simulations aside from your normal uh, standard fluid simulations is that we were able to neglect the displacement current in Ampere's law, which allowed us to eliminate this unnecessary wave mode, which would actually end up breaking our simulation because of it travels at a much higher speed than any mode we were able ever to do. So basically the goal of this was to study instabilities, stabilities, and turbulence in um, the solar wind. And all of these come in the form of waves. So moving on. So there are way too many types of waves and plasma for me to cover here and for us to include in our simulation. And we, we really focused on linear and nonlinear types. And all of these waves have their own properties, um, like their amplitude and their wave number, which is a measure of the spatial frequency of the wave, and it indicates how many oscillations per unit length. And all of these waves propagate inside and through plasma, and they cause very many interesting phenomena, which we are looking at in our simulations. So moving on to my simulation method, which is called the spectral method. This is a very clever and uh, numerical way of solving really complex differential equations. In, uh, in our program, I, I converted many of these parameters and uh, variables from our equations into Fourier or wave space, where we basically decompose uh, a function into a sum of sinusoidal waves and Fourier modes. And that allows us to work around really complex partial derivatives. Because basically inside this imaginary wave space, you have you can you can literally set a partial derivative as, as a variable as a negative i k and then basically it's algebra in the code and so i've included this really great example of how we decompose these functions into sums of waves and we're basically looking at the frequency of them and their profile so moving on to our governing equations um the governing equations were a very extensive list of equations derived from basically every aspect of filament, uh, physics, sorry. And we have, you know, continuity, conservation, Faraday's law, Ohm's law, Ampere's law, all types of stuff. And here are the equations that we were using to fully model these, pla this, this, these pr uh, species within the plasma. And all of these had to be normalized, discretized, and linearized to better use in the code. So moving on to our first aspect that we studied, which was linear waves in the plasma. So these are very small amplitude disturbances that do not significantly alter background plasma pro properties. And the amplitudes of these waves uh, remain proportional to their initial values as they propagate through the plasma. So the way we were able to simulate these was we uh, used randomly generated um, sinusoidal waves to mimic the, uh, the wave nature of these turbulence and multiply them to velocity, density, and magnetic uh, components of the state variables of these equations. So looking at this very pretty graph we have here, this is a spatial uh, temporal representation of the density and magnetic field components after we introduced our linear waves. And you can see here the waves propagating in a very neat crisscross pattern in both graphs, very stable. And 
af after we inserted these very small amplitude waves, we looked at a very cool aspect called the dispersion relation. And the dispersion relation of these waves is the mathematical relationship between the properties of the plasma, like the density and the magnetic field, and the properties of the waves within it. So their wave number, their frequency, their amplitude. And we obtained this relationship directly from deriving it from our original governing equations. And these equations help to check to see if our waves are behaving linearly or not. And we do this by looking at the wave profiles in the spectral realm to see if they match our linear curves that we derive from the equation. So here you can see, uh, here this picture, you can see two of the linear, I mean, two of the dispersion relations, one for the magnetic field and one for the density components. And they're for the circularly polarized electromagnetic waves that we were studying. So looking at the dispersion relation inside the spectral realm, um, we have these graphs here that, that show them in, in wave space. And these dotted red lines you see are the prediction that we derived from our dispersion relation equations from our governing equations. And this blue represents our wave data you can see in both of these just how perfectly our data aligns with these linear prediction curves. And this means, in fact, that what, the, what we simulated is, in fact, behaving in a linear way. So in these graphs, you can see three different wave modes or behaviors that these waves exhibit and that our plasma can support. And so this one on the left is for the, in the plasma density. And this wave mode depicted is the ion acoustic mode. And this acoustic mode is a type of compressional wave that generally arises in plasma due to pressure gradients and uh, density fluctuations, uh, uh, which is what we apply to our system with these small amplitude fluctuations. And on the right here, you see this very flat wave at the bottom. And this is the ion cyclotron mode, which occurs in plasma when the frequency of the wave that we injected inside actually lines up and matches with the frequency of the ions or protons inside of the plasma and this can create a resonant effect um, with the ions which is very very cool and that and so and then also this this big tall wave here is the the whistler mode wave and this represents an electromagnetic wave that will propagate pretty obliquely to field lines um, which means at an, at an angle relative to them, although in our one dimensional case, they were propagating more parallel. And these are usually characterized by a whistling sound they make when they're detected by audio devices. So moving on, you can see here in these, in these two graphs, two different approximations from two different simulation methods. On the right, you can see the, in red, the prediction curve given by the Hall Magneto Hydrodynamics theoretical approximation, which is the dispersion relationship we actually first use in our simulations. And you can see how far off our data was, which caused us to re-derive um, a new dispersion relation from our two and three fluid models that would apply to both. And this is what you see represented on the left. And it fits in a, a much better way, of course. And then I wanted to include a picture from our three fluids dispersion relation, just to show how well the new dispersion relation we derived actually lines up with this. And here in the, basically the same graphs of the, the density and magnetic field, you can see the extra wave mode, which corresponds to the, uh, the helium uh, two plus ion we added. And just like the other, they line up quite well. So Moving on to some more nonlinear behavior, actually, we get to an area called the parametric decay instability in plasma. And so this is another very cool aspect that propagating waves can cause in plasma. And this arises from nonlinear wave behavior. So similarly to how we sent very small amplitude fluctuations through our plasma, we also simulated some very high amplitude fluctuations. And our small amplitude fluctuations had an amplitude of about 1 times 10 to the negative 5, while these have an amplitude of about 0 0.2, so quite, quite higher. And this high energy, high amplitude wave that we send through is called the pump or the mother wave. 
and this can, can, can decay into different modes over time called daughter waves, as well as an ionacoustic wave that conserves energy within the system. And the decay causes these waves to interact non-linearly and eventually be able to transfer energy between one another in a process called three-wave parametric coupling. So here you can see in this temporal spatial graph the decay of this high energy wave. If you look at about T equals 280, in both of these graphs, you can see there's a di disturbance indicative of an instability in our plasma. And so in the density, you can see a fluctuation uh, where it gets lighter, where you can see that the density is actually increased here due to the instability. And on the right, in the magnetic field, you can see um, actually oppositely propagating waves, which represent a different mode been excited from this original high amplitude wave. And I've included an animation to better describe this behavior. As you can see here, is this animation is showing the evolution of the density of the X of the Y and Z components of the magnetic field over time. And originally they are undisturbed until you until you begin to see um, instabilities take place inside of them as they fluctuate over time. I, I'm not really seeing this animation go on my screen, and I hope that you guys can. Here it goes. Yes, over time, it is very, very, uh, very stable, and eventually you can see these fluctuations arise in the density, and then quickly followed by fluctuations in the magnetic field as well. So, Moving on to finalize our, our efforts to simulate this nonlinear turbulence, we look at these in the Fourier space or the spectral realm to make sure our calculations have been correct. And so here in this graph, you can see multiple daughter waves from the mother wave represented in these blue lines. And this graph is to confirm that there is a parametric decay instability within our system. And so you see these purple candles and they represent the different modes that arise from the decay of the original wave. And you see this light purple parallelogram connecting these three candles in the origin. And when you see this shape evident in your, um, in your spectral graphs, that is, that, that is when you know the conditions have in fact been met and there will be a parametric decay instability within your system. And so this confirms that our simulations were complete and thorough and on top of that, correct. And this completes my presentation. And I would just like to acknowledge and thank my mentor because he was more than crucial to this aspect. As I came into this program with zero knowledge and zero background experience of plasma physics, and it was more than an introduction to me. It was a full immersion and he helped me every step of the way with every question I had whenever I had it. And on top of this, this none of this would have happened without FTPP RIP for giving me this internship as well. And thank you guys. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Gareth? Just lots of clapping. All right. Thank you, Gareth. That was great. Thank you guys. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Um, is Ash here? Ash Coleman? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, it just says Auburn, so I wasn't sure. All right, well, um, if you want to go ahead and uh, share your screen, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is too big a picture of me over there. <laughs> Relatable. You, we, can you hear me? We are all gathered in a big lecture room, so we are trying out stuff. Yes, I can hear you, and I can see the presentation. All right. Oh, the oh, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> my friend. We're trying to figure out how many physicists it takes to um, <laughs> set up a PowerPoint presentation. That was just going to blink, apparently. <laughs> All right. We good? All right. Yeah, All right. yeah, we can see it. Awesome. Good. All right. Well, I will try and direct some of it at the camera as well. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm Ash Holman. I'm doing my research here at Auburn University. We are doing um, investigations of the temporal evolution and statistical characterization of filamentary structures um, in my magnetic field in the MDPX device. Um, my mentor is SciCat. He's sitting over here in the corner. <laughs> um, One more again. There we go. All right. So this is MDPX. It's the uh, magnetized dusty plasma experiment. Uh, this lab is run by Ed Thomas. He's the PI. Um, we this is the big magnet. Um, we use RF capacitively coupled plasmas, um, about one to two watts of power, so very weakly ionized. Um, five to 100 millitor of argon. In this particular experiment, it actually is um, neon. Um, we can also do this in krypton and helium um, and possibly other gases, but those have not been tested here yet. Um, the electron temperature is about five eV. Um, ion temperature about 0 0.025 eV, which is room temperature. Um, and uh, Steve Williams data, who I'm uh, analyzing right now, goes up to uh, 3.5 Tesla, but in this specific case, um, I'm using uh, 2.6 Tesla data that's uh, discharging in the magnet. And this is the, the chamber where we create the plasma. Um, so I guess I'll start with what is a filament? Uh, that's a very, very good question. <laughs> Um, as of now, we say it's, these are the elongated structures in the plasma glow that are aligned um, to the magnetic field and they only appear at a relatively high B. Uh, on the left here are the first examples and then on the other side you see um, our pictures. Uh, you can see in the, in no magnetic field, it's a uniform plasma. And as you get higher in magnetic field, you start to see these columns. And from the top, which is where I'm looking at them from, um, they appear as dots or other structures. Um, in lower magnetic field, they're a lot bigger and dimmer. These are some of the different types, the most common types of structures that we see in the filaments, um, circular, elongated, and three-arm spirals. Um, the circular ones are the ones that I'm really looking at here. Um, these filaments we say are stable, relatively stable. In this case, we're talking about uh, shape wise, but when we say filaments are unstable, we mean that in four different cases, uh, they translate in space in the X and Y perpendicular to B. Um, and higher pressures cause them to slow down. And they, the three arms rotate as they move, and so do um, they, uh, we have seen preliminary evidence that the type ones also may um, rotate in this type of motion as well. Uh, they can change shape. They can go from type ones to type twos or type twos to type threes. Um, and they are born and die. Um, otherwise, they appear out of the background plasma and disappear back into the background plasma. So they don't exist for the total time frame of the experiment. These being so unstable are kind of hard to study. So um, we've had to develop new image analysis techniques to study the detailed dynamics of these kinds of um, filaments. In this particular project, we're focusing on the circular ones, type ones. Um, translating across space. There we go. All right. So this is the raw data that I've ended up with. Um, on the left here is the actual fully raw, just magnet is discharging from 2.6 down. Um, as you can see, it looks kind of chaotic. Um, but there are mostly just these bright um, type ones. Uh, on the right here, we've removed background. So 
Um, it's a little less chaotic with all of the background, but it's still kind of like, it would be difficult to manually track these. So instead of worrying about that, um, we come up with a tracking method that was originally used for cell biology. Um, they track the, the cell movement, um, but Ravi Kumar at the University of Memphis, he uses this um, for dust tracking. So I got to speak with him at the Magnet US conference that happened here and um, reformat it for usage in filament tracking. So I ran into quite a few issues um, at, the, at first. Um, it would lose the filaments if they became too dim, if they started to elongate in shape, um, because filaments, unlike dust and cells, they vary in shape, they vary in intensity, and they appear and disappear. Um, so we also, um, we would lose the filaments and recapture them later, or would just completely lose the trajectory. Um, so at first it really didn't look too promising um, until I discovered the particle linking settings. So there are two different settings in that it's um, link, range, link range and displacement. Um, the link range looks across multiple frames and decides whether it's the same object across those few frames. And so I believe my setting was five. Um, and then displacement just says, okay, how many pixels can this object move from one frame to another to still be considered the same object? Um, and so I did uh, 15 pixels for mine and that seemed to fix a lot of the issues I was having originally. Um, it would keep the trajectory for the filaments, um, but it did kind of sometimes capture background structures or if a filament died too close to another filament, it would recapture that secondary one. And um, so still a little bit of kinks to work out, but so far it looks very promising. Um, after that though, Mosaic Suite is pretty good at tracking, but it spits out a lot of data. So just in the 300 frames I was analyzing, it found 700 plus trajectories. Um, so I really didn't want to manually analyze all of that. <laughs> so um, instead I cut that down to about a hundred and um, you can go into a focus area. Um, you can see that on the right side. Uh, if you click like focus on area, it'll show you all of the trajectories that are in that area but it won't print that out very nicely. So um, the lab manager and I went through there and he read out every single one to me and I wrote it down. <laughs> and uh, so we went into Excel on the big one that printed out 700 plus and I filtered it down to the 100 that we had there. Uh, and we found a VBA code, which is just Excel coding and um, split each of those 105-ish um, into their own sheets. And then within those individual sheets, um, you can start to find some of the, the uh, statistical information. Um, this is an example of like what it starts to look like when you have those, when it starts to actually track properly. <laughs> um, and so the left here is the big, what we saw before with the chaotic mess now being tracked. Um, and on the right is the focus area. And that's about right there. Um, so still a lot of uh, stuff going on in there, but um, some pretty interesting information and some pretty cool uh, just stuff about what is actually happening here. So what is actually happening here? What do we get? Um, we can get the lifetimes of filaments, the population per frame, um, the distances traveled, and average displacement traveled. Um, for individual filaments, um, which will give us a possible understanding of the physics of filament formation, of um, pattern formation in magnetized plasma, um, possible evidence of filaments interacting with other filaments and also with the background. Um, and this is very, very preliminary because I've only spent two months doing it. So what, you know, there's plenty of stuff we can do with it in the future. So let's get into what I actually got to. So the first thing um, we've got the lifetimes of filaments. And again, this is only for about a hundred and something within that 
chaotic mess, but we can start to see that a lot of filaments have kind of short lifetimes within this specific like discharge. Um, most of them are under 40 frames when we were analyzing about 300. But there's a little bit of uncertainty in here, of course. Some of these filaments existed in the frame uh, before it started tracking them. So they've lived longer than that. So they may have been at the end of their lifetime. Some of them got lost um, during their trajectory and recaptured as a separate filament. And some of them, uh, if they died too close to another one, it would capture that one instead. And so it'd be a longer than it actually should have been. But um, it's pretty interesting, like preliminary um, lifetimes. They seem to not be a lot of long lifetime, especially up above like 100, actually above 100 really, there's only like four of the 100 that are up there. Um, so then we get into how many filaments exist in each of these frames. Um, again, some of the same issues, but uh, Mosaic spits out a particles per frame with the ones that it has captured. So it misses some of them, but about on average, there are like 35 filaments in a frame. Um, it captured about as low as 27 and it goes up to 41, but um, we can see there's not really a whole lot of variation, even though they're being born and they're dying um, within all of these frames. So, and then we get into fun videos. <laughs> um, and not only can you just go into like a focus area, you can actually focus in on a specific filament and its trajectory. Um, and so you can find the, the distance that it has traveled and also the displacement between its starting point and its ending point. Uh, and we pinpointed or we plugged in the manual, um, like all of the points that it gave us into, uh, into a graph so that we could show that, yes, this tracking works um, and it looks like what it's supposed to. Um, but so, this, these kinds of trajectories show evidence of both filament filament interaction and also filament background um, interaction because they don't just continue moving in a straight path. They're affected by the things that are around them. Um, and this one you can see it kind of stops um, as something dies near it or it, like as this one dies, it does its kind of circular thing where it comes back towards where that filament died and then runs off again. Um, that's actually a lot more prevalent in this one. Um, as you see, it has a really wonky path where it ends up turning completely around. Um, but as you watch the video, you can see why it, or what we think is why it turns around is this filament that comes in and then disappears into the background. And right where it disappears, it comes rushing back right to where it's, where that one has died. So that's a pretty strong uh, suggestion that we may have some filament filament interaction going on. Um, here's an example of a less a less chaotic movement, a less dynamic movement. But as you see, it seems like that might be because there aren't a lot of filaments around this one. Um, but even though this one isn't very dynamically interesting, there are a lot of other filaments around it that are kind of interacting with each other and orbiting in this like top right corner. So even though this specific filament isn't particularly interesting, the ones around it are. Um, so what can we do in the future? What am I gonna do in the future possibly? Um, we'd like to compare, there are regimes of these, specifically of this data set where it's a lot more chaotic than in other areas. And it seems like, um, the filaments have like shorter lifetimes in those more chaotic areas. So we would like to compare um, this type of stability with uh, the background plasma fluctuation and see if there's a correlation there. Um, it would also be interesting to see if this works for non-circular filaments um, and for the dimmer type ones because uh, mosaic works a little better with bright uh, like centers or like bright dust. And so 
with the non-circular, I think it would be, um, especially with like this video that I have on the side, there are very bright centers to them. And so I think it would be easier to track these than the, even the dimmer type ones. Um, we'd also like to track elements that don't translate across space as much um, and possibly ones that rotate as well. Um, and uh, also get to present this at APSDP, which would be really neat. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the wonderful people here at Auburn who have made me feel very welcome. <laughs> um, Cameron, Jordan, Ellie, Sycad, Blake, Sadar, <laughs> um, and the um, others down on the left who are not here. <laughs> and Ravi and Steve, who I know are both online. And Steve's data is what I've been looking at, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, all work and no play makes a very good <laughs> science. So <laughs> that's what we're going to do. I made it. <laughs> Multiple times. All right, and thank you, everybody. Bruce, and this summer I was working on nanomechanical resonators based on monic nano and tophite crystal membranes. Well, so basically, when a freestanding film of a 2D material is placed over a, over a micro orifice on a surface, Film behaves like a membrane that can vibrate in response to ex external influence. For example, the 2D material uh, MOS2 placed on a circular hole of 5 to 10 micrometers. The membrane has a natural frequency of oscillation in the 10 to 25 megahertz, depending on the number of atomic monolayers it comprises. So, in other words, right here we have um, what we call a resonator, which, like I said, is made out of um, MOS2. And basically, depending on how thick it is, that's going to go, and it's going to depend how much it's going to vibrate in, right in between the 10 to 25 megahertz. Uh, our setup it was pretty basic. Uh, here, here we have a laser where it's, the light comes out right here and runs into the filter. What the filter does is it basically, depending on how strong you want the light to come out, you could mess with the, with the filter, and that will, you know, you can control how strong you want the light. So then the, the light hits the first mirror, which then goes through a beam expander. And at the end of the day, same, it serves the same purpose as the density filter. Then we run into our second mirror, and the light goes all the way into our vacuum chamber. Then the light comes back to our first beam splitter, which sends 50% of the light uh, to our camera. And the other 50% is sent to our other beam splitter, which sends it to our photo detector. And that's how we're able to measure our um, frequency. Um, during this, this summer, I had to make some adjustments to our setup. Basically, one of the things I did was we set up a, a compact chamber with sapphire window of high prosperity. The reason why we did this is because as you can see right here, this, were, this was our original setup, in which you can see the chip right there. But the glass is right on top of it was a bed it wasn't too clear for us to see, so we went ahead and set up a smaller chamber with a sapphire glass, which is much clearer. We also, uh, like I said, we basically moved the chip from this bigger chamber to a smaller one with a uh, new glass on top and connected our uh, vacuum system to try to bring down the atmospheric pressure inside of the chamber itself, so that's a 3.3 millitor. Uh, that way we could get a better uh, reading of the vibration, and it should be adequate for the detection of MOS2 resonance. Uh, some problems that, we're, that we ran into uh, towards the end was now that we have the vacuum set up right next to our, you know, for to bring down the pressure, we were running into problems where the vacuum was causing vibrations, and a couple of a couple of ways we could fix this. Um, by adding vibration and oscillation, or we could try to turn off the vacuum pump and try to get a reading once, once it's off without losing vacuum. And that's it.
this day as well because they use it in many applications in sensors, detectors, high power magnets. But basically, to get to the superconductive state, we need to get past the critical temperature, which is usually a very, very low temperature that is very hard to attain. For that reason, working with iron selenide, FTSE, with a uh, critical temperature of around 10 Kelvin, we couldn't do it manually because that's not effective, that's not efficient, it's very hard to do. So we had to devise a thermodynamic cryogenic cycle that is based on the Gifford-McMahon cycle, named after the two scientists who invented it. And as you can see, this cycle uses the compressor, the expander, and a pump. Those are the three main components that drive the setup and help maintain the conditions effective for superconductivity and cooling. So for this cycle, as you can see, uh, I sketched the TS diagram for it. This cycle, of course, has four main processes involved. One and two is the compression, and three to four is the expansion. As you can see, we have a cooling curve from two to three, and then we have heating back the compressor. And for this uh, temperature to be attained, we need to maintain a very specific pressure, around 10 to 100 millibar. And for that to be reached, we make use of this big unit. It's a mechanical vacuum pump. And as you can see, I also made use of additional components like the temperature controller that displays the temperature inside of the expander and a pressure regulator that measures the pressure inside of the expander shroud. And that's where we place our <coughs> superconductor samples. We place them on a, on a platform inside of the expander and that's where cooling happens and when superconductivity can, can be measured. In the results section, discussion, uh, discussion session, section, uh, I did know that I did track the temperature and the voltage as a function of time. I did, and I did notice that uh, as time went on, as the cycle got repeated, repeated over and over again, cooling became a harder thing to do. And that makes sense because uh, as you're going down further into the temperature, like nearing superconductivity, it becomes harder for the because there's a temperature gradient and it measures basically the difference between temperature of the object and the cooling medium, which is liquid helium, is the cooling gas we use in this cycle, it becomes harder to cool as you move further down. Over there, I did track the cooling curve. As you can see, it's a bit steep at the beginning. This is uh, because cooling is kind of easy. And near the end, cooling becomes harder. So the cooling rate decreases with the cycle. And over here, that's mainly the full cycle set up. As you can see, the compressor, the expander. We have the temperature controller I mentioned earlier. This is the pump. And that's where the sample is placed. And for future work, we did manage to get to 10 Kelvin. It took around five and a half hours. That can happen. And for the future, we want to try getting the iron selenide sample inside of the expander so we can try uh, the resistivity of it. Once, once it reaches superconductivity.